Hello and welcome to an event by the International Peace Institute and the LC Initiative for Women in Peace Operations on the Perceptions of Women Peacekeepers. My name is Phoebe Donnelly and I'm the Senior Fellow and, a, and the Head of the Women, Peace and Security Program at the International Peace Institute. I'll be moderating today's panel discussion and our Q&A. And we're going to start with some opening remarks by Dr. Jenna Russo, Director of Research and Head of the Brian Urquhart Center for Peace Operations at the International Peace Institute. Jenna will be, remarks will be followed by Rear Admiral Rebecca Patterson, who is the current Chief of Staff for Professional Conduct and Culture at the Canadian Department of National Defense. She served as Commander of One Health Services Group Deputy Commander of Canadian Forces Health Services Group, Director General, Professional Military Conduct for Operation Honor, and as Commander Canadian Forces Health Services. After the brief opening remarks, we'll have a panel discussion, and then we will have plenty of time for Q&A, so please be sure to submit your questions in the chat, in, on Twitter, or on any of the ways you are viewing this. So I will turn the floor to Dr. Jenna Russo. Thank you so much for that, Phoebe, and for the opportunity to be here. As Phoebe mentioned, I'm the director of research at IPI and also the head of our Brian Urquhart Center for Peace Operations. And I really want to welcome you um, and thank you so much for joining, on the, joining us this morning for what promises to be a very interesting and important discussion on a topic that is frankly too often overlooked in discussions on peacekeeping. Um, and that is a topic of community perceptions. So specifically this panel today will be focusing on the ways that communities perceive women peacekeepers. Our panelists today will present and discuss some of IPI's recent research and analysis on the perspectives of populations from countries that contribute uniform personnel to peacekeeping, as well as from host communities where peacekeepers are based. And we'll also get to hear from a representative of a national government looking to increase the meaningful participation of women in peacekeeping. Rather than assume that what these different groups think about women peacekeepers, this panel seeks to directly examine and reflect upon this question. Today's event is the final event from IPI's partnership with the LC Initiative pilot phase. Women in Peace Operations makes up a key part of the WPS program's work at IPI and among its research. The program has published studies on engagement platoons, the sexual abuse of peacekeepers and WPS mandates in peacekeeping operations. This is an area that IPI is going to continue to focus on in the future and we invite you to stay tuned um, for future research and to check out each of these publications um, which are all available on the IPI website. So thank you again for being here. We're so happy to have you. We're very grateful to our panelists and our researchers for their important contributions today. Um, and now I will turn the floor to Rear Admiral Patterson for her opening remarks. Thank you, my apologies as I play with technology. So before I begin my comments, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that I'm coming to you today from Ottawa, from the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe First Nations people. And I'm very pleased to be here. I wanna thank the International Peace Institute for organizing today's virtual event. I look forward to the findings of the paper, The Impact of Women, uh, Peacekeepers on Public Support for Peacekeeping and Troop and Police Contributing Countries. And as this work and event demonstrates, the Government of Canada values external research, and we're so pleased that through the LC Initiative for Women and Peace Operations, we continue to support such critical research. The LC Initiative is a priority for the Government of Canada, and we are actively engaged in understanding and addressing barriers to women's participation in peacekeeping operations, which means looking to the Canadian Armed Forces at international operations and supporting partners to address findings in their own militaries. Of course, to deploy women on peacekeeping operations, armed forces must be trying to accelerate the recruitment and retention of diverse women. And Canada's defense policy, strong, secure and engaged, clearly states that the Canadian armed forces must reflect the diversity of the country we protect. Diverse perspectives contribute to informed decision-making and to the effectiveness overall. As I often say, 
if you ask 50% of people the solution, you get 50% of the answer, and therefore including women is absolutely critical. It is common to hear well-intentioned arguments that having diverse women in uniform on deployments is needed for operational effectiveness. And while there is an element of truth in some contexts, but overall, first and foremost, Canadian women have the right to pursue their interests in serving their country and having a fulfilling military career, not as a quota, but as people who belong. Nevertheless, gender inequality is pervasive and persists throughout every country in the world. We continue to work to ensure the Canadian Armed Forces diverse women members can serve and progress in a career that is free from discrimination, bias, harassment, and sexual misconduct. Armed forces around the world, like other institutions, are facing institutional barriers that continue to challenge the establishment and maintenance of diverse, inclusive, and equitable work environments. And peacekeeping does start at home. This means that we must be conscious and deliberate in our decision-making so as not to reinforce harmful gender stereotypes about diverse women's competencies. Specifically, we must not over-deploy the same small pool of women to meet our targets. In Canada, it very often happens that it is the same group of women asked at the last moment again and again to deploy. All of these issues and contexts affect public perception of armed forces and of diverse women in uniform. This is why research such as what is being presented here today is so important. It asks the questions, do we understand the perceptions that are out there? How do we acknowledge and inform decisions on policy, public affairs and communication operations so that we're advancing gender equality in our own institutions and country, as well as supporting partners to do so? How are we engaging with and correcting negative or harmful perceptions so that they do not counter the efforts being made to increase gender equality in armed forces? Thank you very much for having me here today. And now I look forward to hearing from our panelists and look forward to this rich dialogue today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rear Admiral Patterson and Dr. Jenna Russo. It is my pleasure to now turn it over to our panelists as a reminder, please put any questions throughout the event into the Q&A function if you're joining us on the webinar or on social media. We are going to begin with remarks from Dr. Laura Huber. Dr. Huber is an assistant professor at the University of Mississippi whose research focuses on how women's integration into and gender norms within security institutions is connected with effectiveness, community relations, abuse of power, and sexual violence and exploitation. To kick off your remarks, Dr. Huber, can you tell us about your research and a forthcoming IPI publication on the perceptions of peacekeepers within the populations of troop and police contributing countries and how these perceptions are informed by gender? All right. Well, first of all, uh, thank you to both IPI, uh, Phoebe, as well as Canada and the LC Initiative for putting this event together and creating the space for us to have this discussion. Um, so as Phoebe had said, my name is Laura Huber. And for the past several years, I've been fortunate enough, fortunate enough to be able to work as a consultant with the great team at IPI to help design and implement surveys to examine public perceptions of women peacekeepers in TCCs. And I'm sure as many of us are familiar with, there's a common claim often put forth by the UN policymakers and scholars that women peacekeepers will improve the effectiveness and legitimacy of peace operations. And in particular, women peacekeepers tend to be pointed to as better able to access and build trust with women from host country communities, um, a topic which I think some of the fellow speakers will discuss in more detail. But in this research, we decided to look beyond just the host country to examine how the deployment of women peacekeepers may also impact public opinion on peacekeeping in troop and police contributing countries. So why would the deployment of women impact public support and perhaps increase the legitimacy of peacekeeping in the TCCs? Well, from other research, we know that as more women participate in public institutions like the police or the military, 
the public begins to view the institution as more legitimate and trustworthy. And this perception is commonly based on gender stereotypes that women are less violent, more altruistic, and more community oriented than men. Thus, when the public in ATCC sees women peacekeepers, they may assume that the peace operation more broadly is more humanitarian oriented, more altruistic, and less dangerous, which could then increase support for peacekeeping more broadly. And even beyond just support for peacekeeping, seeing women deployed in a mil as a military peacekeeper may challenge traditional gender norms in the TCC and increase support for women's rights. And we actually know that the government and media often discuss and promote women peacekeepers to the public, and they often do so in very gendered ways. And they may do this in some ways, either knowingly or unknowingly invoking some of these gender stereotypes to increase support for peacekeeping. And yet, while the deployment of women peacekeepers may increase support for peacekeeping, another common concern that's brought up is that if a woman peacekeeper were to die or be injured while deployed, this may lead to more anger and criticism of peacekeeping than if a man were to die due to gendered norms that tend to cast women as being more innocent or uh, in need of protection. So to test some of these different theories about how the public in TCCs reacts to women peacekeepers under different circumstances, we conducted four survey experiments in India and South Africa with around 1,100 respondents in each survey. And I'll very briefly go over the design of the surveys. I'm happy to talk about this in more detail in the Q&A if anyone is interested. So with the first set of surveys conducted in each country, we showed the respondents a hypothetical news story about the deployment of a military contingent from their country to MINUSCO in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And half of our respondents read a story about the deployment of a mixed gender contingent and half read about the deployment of a contingent with all men. The second set of uh, survey experiments that we conducted was similar in that we showed respondents a story about a hypothetical peacekeeper killed while deployed to MINUSCO, and half of our respondents read a story about a woman who was killed and half read about a man who was killed. And then after reading one of these four stories, we asked respondents about their support for peacekeeping, their views on how effective the contingent would be at some tasks, and their overall support for women's rights. And then finally, since the public does not directly make decisions about peacekeeping deployments in most countries, we also wanted to understand what government representatives think public perceptions about women peacekeepers are. So to do this as a preliminary investigation, we also surveyed members of the UN Special Committee on Peacekeeping Operations to examine what the diplomats believed are the public perceptions of peacekeepers in the TPCC that they represented. To very quickly preview the results, the study revealed that to some extent in India and in South Africa, the respondents that read about mixed gender units were more likely to support peacekeeping, including having more of a desire to send more peacekeepers in the following year and to send more women peacekeepers in particular. However, the respondents did not always react differently to women peacekeepers than they did to men peacekeepers. So for example, casualties among women did not lead to less support for peacekeeping than casualties among men. And while our respondents thought that the mixed gender contingent may be more or less effective at some tasks, such as being less effective at preventing violence, the respondents thought that the mixed gender contingent would be equally effective as the all man contingent in most of our tasks that we asked about. And then finally, while our respondents did appear to shift some of their beliefs on gender equality after hearing about women peacekeepers, the effects differed across our two countries and our two contexts. So for example, we've only found that being exposed to a woman peacekeeper increased gender equality in South Africa and not India. And it only happened when the respondents heard about a woman casualty in particular and not just the deployment of a mixed gender unit. And 
I think this further underscores the need to more carefully understand and explore how women peacekeepers will be perceived not only as unique or different from men, but how in some contexts they will be viewed as the same or equal to men. Um, in other words, how in some contexts and under some conditions, women peacekeepers may be viewed as blue helmets first and women second. And then finally, just to quickly comment on the other set of surveys that we did of the C-34, we did find some gaps on how government representatives believed the public would respond to women peacekeepers and how we actually found the public responding in our surveys. But the majority did report that they did consider public opinion when making deployment decisions and that they wanted to improve public support for peacekeeping. So overall, while women peacekeepers in this study were sometimes perceived differently by the public, their impact shouldn't be simplistically assumed to always be the same across all contexts uh, and across all possible perceptions. In the same way that women are not a monolith, the public is not a monolith and how they are going to re react to women peacekeepers and what they will assume about them. So we need more awareness about how public perceptions of both women and men as peacekeepers interacts with other social, cultural, and political norms. Uh, and so I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and if you'd like to hear more of information about our findings, uh, as Phoebe had said, keep your eye out for hopefully a publication coming out soon. Thank you, Dr. Huber. It is now my pleasure to turn it to Ms. Susie Nayoon Williams. She is a lawyer, founder of the National Alliance of Women Lawyers South Sudan, and an independent researcher who has worked with numerous institutions, including UN Women, the Global Network of Women Peace Builders as a Women Peace and Security Fellow, and is currently serving as GNWP's East Africa Focal Point for the implementation of WPS and YPS. So Susie's comments are going to take us, we heard from Laura about the public perceptions in TPCCs and of women peacekeepers. And now Susie's going to talk more about the perceptions within host communities. So where peacekeepers are based, how are they perceiving women peacekeepers? And so Susie, can you tell us more about your research on host communities, gender views of peacekeepers in South Sudan? What did you learn and what questions remain on this really important topic? Thank you. Susie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Phoebe. And thank to the IPI for giving us me this opportunity and to be part of the, these panel discussions. Um, I thank all the colleagues for the following up and thank to Dr. Lauren too for highlighting some of the perceptions about the women piece in, in the peace operations. Um, it's, it's something that all of us have been assuming and almost everyone has been assuming that women will change the narrative or the face of the peacekeeping operations. But there is another perception as well why such is being assumed from the, from, from the host communities. So basically, if you see, I came from South Sudan, a country that has been, you know, experiencing conflict for the last nine years and uh, before that there, had, there were peacekeepers and uh, it's also a country where host communities are very conservative. We have a very conservative uh, culture and we have our own norms on how women should behave to foreigners, to males, female, you know, the gender dynamic is very conservative. So given the fact that uh, most peacekeepers are foreigners and their male foreigners is also is also a very big challenge to the peacekeepers, especially with information acquiring and also with interacting with all the host community members without discrimination of gender. So uh, my recent research, which I did with IPI on the perceptions of, of women in the peacekeeping peacekeeping operation by the host communities gave me a sense that, uh, in fact, the assumption has some realities in it, and also it has a different narrative or different dynamic why it's important for women to be part of the peacekeepers. Yes, it's believed that it's a good thing to have women in the peacekeeping forces as part of gender equality, but also it's important for getting more informations that are credible from women. 
in South Sudan, you find out that um, peacekeepers patrols along the roads, especially in the deep, you know, in, in the deep um, rural areas, which are actually experiencing um, uh, conflict or insecurity. And most of the people who live in the host, among the host communities, most of the time are women because they have to take care of their families. They have to be, you know, available to, to provide security for their families. And they know these women know day-to-day -day activities of what is going on and what is not happening. And it's very difficult for, for them also to interact with peacekeepers. I, I was so shocked. So many people know about the UN peacekeepers the Unimis peacekeepers, but none of the women I talk to have interact with peacekeepers. So it's like they, they have that gaps and most of them were very, very honest. They were, were like, you know, we see the peacekeepers passing, we do not talk to them. We don't even know what are their plans. We have information, but because, you know, I cannot talk to a male peacekeeper because that's, you know, it's, it's not how our culture allow us to talk to male, female, I mean, to male, let alone a, a, a male peacekeeper who is a foreigner. So you find out that most of the peacekeepers who are male and they are patrolling uh, the areas don't have a direct conversation or direct contact with the, with the host communities and especially women who are always in, in, the, in the area. Another thing was uh, women whom I spoke to, I talked to, they were very interested. They were like, it's important to have women in the peacekeepers because it will, first, it will give us an opportunity to interact maybe with them if they don't keep themselves away. And uh, if my husband, one woman was very honest and she like, oh, if my husband find out that I am speaking with the peacekeeper, he will beat me. And I was like, why? And she like, oh, we don't talk to male peacekeepers. And in place like, wow, is very is very risky because in 2018 we know we have the the incident of the Ghanaian peacekeepers who were accused of uh, being uh, had being involved in some sexual exploitation with women from the host community. That stereotype have remained as a threat, and it has been very very difficult for even women from the host communities to interact with the with the peacekeepers. And uh, in place like Venti, place like Ball and place like Malacca, you know, these are highly insecure, you know, areas. And sometimes you find out that women say, oh, we just see peacekeepers passing. We don't even talk to them. Some women were very honest and some men as well, they were very honest and they were like, you know what? If women are involved in the peacekeeping operations, it will ease the communication. It will ease the, uh, the population to provide credible information of insecurity and also where they should also be available to support the civilian. So the assumption of women being part of the peacekeeping operations is not like an assumption that has no a basis, but it is uh, an assumption that many people from the communities have in their mind, in their heart, but they don't have a platform to address or to share how they feel about the peacekeeping operations. Uh, some people, some women as well, and some men, some respondents were very interested to say that, oh, it's another way of encouraging women too from within the South Sudanese community to see women in the peacekeeping operation. They will are expiring for such job and they might also join, the, you know, they might join the military, they might also be interested because sometimes it is designed that peacekeeping operation is a male job. It is a male, something that could not be done by a woman, by a female. So it's also something that will encourage women within the South Sudanese context to also have aspiration for working inside uh, uh, military spaces and also to be part of the peacekeeping if, in case, you know, if such opportunity avails. So it, it, it was so, so interesting because everyone was saying, yes, yes, we need women peacekeepers with different reason. Somewhere like we want them to be part of the, the peacekeeping operation because they will be able to interact with women. Women felt they are left out and they could not have a direct conversation with peacekeepers. Some were thinking it is a good idea because it will give women the aspiration, there will be role models and will also give even our government an opportunity to see that women can serve in the military anywhere, you know. So uh, it is something that is, uh, you know, not an assumption that has no basis. But of course, my interaction, my my takeaway was uh, 
everyone need to, to see women in the peacekeeping operation. And my takeaway will, is that uh, the UN mission peacekeepers in South Sudan really don't have any direct contact with the host communities. The gap is so wide. I was also reading about a story of one of the Australian peacekeeper who was working with Onmis, and she 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 went to one of the villages around Juba, where she, and it was raining and and muddy, and it became very dark, and you know. But she went there to, to help one of the women from the displaced community who was having some eye infections. So this is something women in the peacekeeping operation who do beyond the civilian protection in terms of violence, but also to interact and understand some of the diseases affecting women and help them in a free and the conversation could even give them a, you know, that kind of freedom to understand uh, some of the role of the peacekeepers. So finally, I would say that everyone wants to see women in the peacekeeping operation for one reason, to interact with women and get credible information. Secondly, also to aspire women to look for such positions and also be part of the peacekeeping operation and to create an equality within the UN peacekeeping operation as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susie. We really appreciate your comments and sharing about your research in South Sudan. It's, it's such a challenging topic to research and uh, it's something we'll continue to explore. So I'm now going to turn to Dr. Lindy Heineken. Dr. Heineken is a professor in the Vice Dean Research of the Faculty of Arts and Social Science at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. She's the author of South Africa's Post-Apartheid Military, Lost in Transition and Transformation, and serves on numerous academic boards, including the Council of the Inter-University Seminar on Armed Forces and Society, and as president for the International Sociological Association Armed Forces and Conflict Resolution Research Committee. Dr. Heineken, I'm wondering if you can tell us more about how the public perceptions of uniformed women peacekeepers further entrenches gender dichotomies within uniform structures. The floor is yours. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for your invitation to speak to this event. And I'm very much going to speak to my own research that I've done over the past decade on gender integration in the South African Armed Forces and my research on peacekeeping. So I've been asked to share my views on whether gender, uh, whether public perceptions of uniform uh, women peacekeepers further entrench gender dichotomies within uniform structures, um, which, which as we've spoken here and I, from the previous presentations we've heard, this all really does influence women's meaningful, meaningful participation in peacekeeping operations. So if one looks at the first aspect of the question on public perception, to answer this question, we must first understand what influences public perception of women serving in the military as societal norms and values inevitably influence military culture and the integration of women. And there are a number of factors that play a role here. And the first is, of course, is national legislation, um, which either supports the right of women to serve in the military or not. But where this exists, um, it, it may lead to, it leads to greater acceptance of women in the military. However, this is politically driven and can lead, because the second ask a question, a part of the question is, how does it influence in gender integration in the military and women's participation in the military, is, is that it may, it, may, it may lead to greater acceptance, but where it is politically driven through quotas or an assertive affirmative action campaign, it can lead to um, resistance. Um, to, especially where it poses a threat to the gender order, order. The second factor influencing public opinion is where women are recruited based on either a shortage of men. And we see this, for example, in, in the Ukraine uh, as well, but it's very interesting to see how women are portrayed in, in, in that conflict or war um, as, as, a, um, as an example here. And the third is, uh, is, just excuse me for a moment, I have got a dog that has just opened my door. Um, 
so it's not children, it's dogs, sorry. Um, a third is where women are recruited because they, uh, they are certain skills needed by the military. And the latter is based on, on the premise of gender difference, that women add value. But this often is premised on essentialist claims that can perpetuate gender dichotomies. Influencing all of the above um, um, is, of course, the extent to which masculinity and femininity uh, or masculinity and femininity and patriarchal values are privileged in societies, which can discourage women from joining the military and also from remaining in the, in the military. So all these societal influences are amplified within the military context, both within the armed forces themselves and as we've heard from the previous speakers, um, I think Susie indicated that within the context of which peacekeepers are deployed. And why is this the case? Because, it, because armed forces typically adopt a gender neutral approach to gender integration. And this leads to what has been called the cult of homogeneity, where women must fit into the existing male uh, order. So hence women need to assimilate masculine values to be accepted as equal, resulted in diluted femininity. And at the same time, they come under performance pressure to meet training standards, but where they come to assume a, a, a critical mass of competent women, this may cause a gender backlash. And we see it in South Africa, leading to various other forms of gender discrimination that may affect leadership and influence in decision-making. And I can give plenty of examples of this. So we need to remember that when we're looking at peacekeeping training, it continues to take the shape of combat exercises, adopting a warrior emphasis with the, with the emphasis on infantry core um, expertise. In this training, one does not see the equivalence in the value assigned to a combination of masculine and feminine traits to enable soldiers to have a broader repertoire of skills when deployed on peacekeeping operations. So we are assuming that they can reform certain roles where actually they are trained for security, but not and not with a broader repertoire of skills in the missions that require the responsibility to protect. So there is no regendering of the military in terms of valuing positive masculinities and positive femininities. And instead, we see the inclusion of women's bodies as a solution based on essentialist claims that women, that women are more peace-loving, conciliatory, and less confrontational, and therefore make good peacekeepers. And framing female skills and competencies as soft, friendly, approachable, and is less, it's, it's convenient because it's less destabilizing to the pre-existing gendered norms within military organization. Why? Because women are seen as continuing something different. It's supplementary, it's complementary to operational effectiveness. And this means, maintains the gender order in the way the military is organized around its roles, its responsibilities, its activities, and the contributions of men and women. And this is not necessarily bad, um, as it is widely acknowledged that women are in a better position to interact with the local population as well, so, so both soliciting their cooperation and address, addressing the needs uh, of the local population. However, this is context specific. And my research has shown, and I think Susie hinted to this, has shown that, um, um, that while women are valued for being able to make a, spe a special contribution, they still face what I call functional exclusion on based on gender dichotomies within uniform structures, some of which I've just handled. Um, so functional exclusion refers to gender-based exclusion of women from taking part um, on an, an active part in peacekeeping, for example, where women are discouraged from going on foot patrols or being deployed into the red zone um, due to a threat to their safety, hence framing them as potential victims or victimizing them and, and restricting them to base. And this really denies women the opportunity to deploy as, as 
as equal on these missions and of course to interact. The another functional reason for the exclusion is that uh, is deploying that that serving or deploying women poses a security risk where they slow down patrols or where they become the target of attack because of the presence of women. And we do see evidence of this in uh, um, Darfur, Sudan. So besides this functional exclusion, they also, there's also reports of physical exclusion. And that is why you're not seeing the women peacekeepers, is that where they are deployed with the men, because of these, pre these reasons, concerns for their safety, um, and that they are a security threat seem to weaken the unit or platoon, they're then asked to conceal their identity. So you look at the peacekeepers and all you are seeing is peacekeepers, you're not seeing women peacekeepers and they are requested to remain in their armored vehicle, for example. Um, so, this, so this undermines the ability to interact with the local population and to diff diffuse um, potential conflict situations. Of course, this is not the case in, um, in, in, and is context specific. And this pertains to another aspect, which is often un overlooked. And again, Susie hinted to this, and this is cultural exclusion. There's the assumption that women CPCs can interact with the local population and shift gender norms. But this is only possible where they can communicate with the local population, understand the gender dynamics embedded within those societies, and where local women are willing to engage with the female peacekeepers. This is not always the case. They often are prevented from engaging with the female peacekeepers. And I can give you examples of this that's happened to our peacekeepers in, 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 in the Darfur region. In this regard, regard, a sad reality is that both male and female peacekeepers often know very little about the gender dynamics embedded within host societies, which can affect public opinion of peacekeepers. And to conclude, I would say that in my opinion, I think there needs to be more investment in creating awareness of the gendered nature of conflict. If peacekeepers and specifically women peacekeepers are to be more effective in responsibility to protect roles. This requires greater introspection into how women and women or men are trained deployed support and supported where their tasks are to protect vulnerable populations in peacekeeping operations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heineken. Finally, our last panelist is Colonel Mamoun Azaid Salehin. He's a senior instructor at the Bangladesh Institute of Peace Support Training, and he has previously worked as staff officer of operations at the force headquarters as a peacekeeper with an infantry battalion in Minusma in Mali, and as an instructor of United Nations Peace, Peace Support Operations at the School of Infantry and Tactics, as well as the School of Signals. So Colonel Salehin, as we transition to perceptions and presumptions, assumptions, it's also helpful to understand what's actually occurring within troop and police contributing countries. So I'm hoping that you could speak to us coming from the largest contributor of troop and police personnel to UN peace operations, Bangladesh. What steps is Bangladesh taking to support the meaningful participation of uniform women in peace operations? Colonel Salehin, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Phoebe, uh, IPI and the Alpha Initiative Fund and the eminent uh, panelists for inviting us to this event. Uh, it is my honor to speak for Bangladesh Armed Forces, uh, being the largest contributor of, contributing of troops and the police personnel. So I should straight away jump into the question given to me, that is what steps Bangladesh is taking to support the meaningful participation of uniform women in peace operations. So the first step uh, uh, Bangladesh has taken, uh, because it is beyond the Bangladesh Armed Forces, taken at the national level, According to the uh, Security Resolution 1325 uh, on WPS, the Bangladesh government has already promulgated the National Action Plan, uh, NAP, and according to the directives given at the NAP, Bangladesh Armed Forces is in the process of promulgating its Defense Action Plan. The first draft of the plan is completed and will be finalized in a short time, and that will actually give us the uh, legal basis of taking uh, every action on WPS. 
So the, uh, if I go back to the history, the inclusion of female members in Bangladesh Armed Forces, except the medical code, because that is started far back, uh, dates back to the year 2000 with the induction of female officers in the three services. And female soldiers were first inducted, recruited in January uh, 2006. And now at present with the gradual recruiting, we have 4,000 female members who are working in Bangladesh Armed Forces, both home and abroad in different capacities and status. Bangladesh, uh, Bangladeshi female peacekeepers are being deployed in all the UN peacekeeping mission across the globe. They are being deployed every year in the in a yearly rotation. As of September uh, 2021, 27 female staff officers, two female military observers, and 149 female contingent members uh, uh, were deployed in the mission area. So uh, Bangladesh is, uh, is always a strong opponent of female engagement in the armed forces. The best example is uh, four out of 13 military schools are for girls in Bangladesh. And these military schools serves as a period center for the recruitment of female members of Bangladesh Armed Forces for the officers. Army, Navy, and Air Force headquarters, recruiting units, Bangladesh National Cadet Corps, Inter-Services Selection Board uh, conducts regular female recruitment so that we have a uh, regular supply of the female in uniform. Branch recruiting units and Bangladesh National Cadet Corps conducts motivation classes in various schools and colleges and universities throughout the country to promote female recruitment so that they go to the different schools and colleges and they actually uh, do some lectures so that people are, uh, they, especially females, are encouraged to join the armed forces. These are done uh, throughout the year. We hope uh, that through these measures, recruitment of female members will gradually increase. And it is important to increase the recruitment to ensure the female participation in UN peacekeeping, peacekeeping operation as per the target set by the Uniform Gender Parity Strategy 2018 to 2028, which is set by UN. Bangladesh Armed Forces uh, give due importance to the welfare of the female officers and soldiers to ensure the retention in the force. The female members are given six months maternity leave with salary, and they enjoy flexible working arrangements and the environment. WPS agenda has been included in all the training activities of all training centers across Bangladesh Armed Forces academics, school academies, schools and courses, female members. Female members are also incorporated into the special security force, the bright example, which is an elite force where only the selected members of the armed forces personnel get a chance to serve. So we have also the female members. And you have seen in the media that we have got uh, female pilots and even the female paratroopers in our armed forces. So Bangladesh Armed Forces is ensuring the, fo the following steps to guard against gender-based discrimination and violence. And then the first one is the Bangladesh Armed Forces have established a gender network and we have a gender advisor at the Armed Forces Division, which is the Prime Minister's Office of the Three Services Headquarters, and the Gender Focal Point Network across the three services down to the field level. We have also institutionalized the Gender Focal Point Network, and the network is functional at all levels and is supported by senior leadership. We have a zero tolerance policy on the sexual exploitation and abuse, and action is taken whenever uh, reported such cases. Bangladesh Armed Forces have a complete and functional reporting policy about C, which includes formal and numerous informal reporting channels. Uh, acclimatization is carried out during the interaction of women into the Bangladesh Armed Forces to remove uh, the social or socioeconomic barriers that may have. We ensure self sustainment of mission contingents to maintain their privacy, which is again an important requirement for Bangladeshi context. Finally, Bangladesh Armed Forces have uh, successfully taken part in the first programming round of the LC Initiative Fund. Our project funding has been already approved by the LC Initiative uh, Fund Secretariat. Now we are working on the uh, administrative arrangement to receive the funds. This fund is being provided for the construction of a separate accommodation for our female peacekeepers at Bangladesh Institute of Peace Support Operation Training uh, to promote gender equity and facilitate women participation in peacekeeping operation. The construction of a separate female accommodation is, was a uh, need of time, and provision of this separate female accommodation is required to only to conform to the social and religious culture prevailing both at home and during the UN mission development. Constructing a female accommodation, this, is, this will be a 60 uh, peacekeeper female accommodation of three straight building. It will uh, enable us to train 241 peacekeepers annually with an improved female supportive environment. So we think that with this added uh, capacity in the BIPSOP, uh, we'll be able to train more uh, female peacekeepers because we foresee that in future, 
the number of female peacekeepers will be increased in Bangladesh, and we are going to have more female peacekeepers in Bangladesh. And to echo with the uh, Dr. Henniken, I like to say that we are actually in Bangladesh. Uh, uh, we are the proponent of uh, employment of uh, female peacekeepers in core peacekeeping job, not the typical uh, job uh, as it has been viewed as the, it is the job of the female peacekeeper. We want that they should be uh, take the equal load and they, they should do the core peacekeeping job while after being deployed in the mission. So Bangladesh Peace Support, Bangladesh Peace Support Operation Training, Gipsot, my institute, and the whole Bangladesh Armed Forces is working on that goal. And hopefully, uh, we'll gradually we'll be meeting the target set by the United Nations Gender Trade Strategy, and we'll have equal participation of women in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colonel Salehin. So I'm now gonna start with some questions from the Q&A. Um, this first question comes to us from LinkedIn, and I'm gonna direct this to Dr. Huber because I know you've been really seeped into this research. So I'm wondering if you can talk about is there empirical research about the actual impact of women peacekeepers on peacekeeping operations? And I'll add to that, you know, what does, do we know anything from the research? What does the research tell us? And then I think the second part of the question, is there a link between the number of female blue helmets and sexual abuse of local populations, for example, or casualty rates? So Laura, I'll turn it to you to start. And then if anyone else wants to chime in on that question, just let me know. All right, thank you. This is a, a really great question. Uh, and one you may have noticed when I was talking, I actually tried very specifically not to make any claims about whether or not women actually do behave differently or impact effectiveness, uh, because this is kind of a, a very important question, but in some cases, there's still a lot of unknowns um, about the actual, quote unquote, actual impact of women. Um, and part of this is because it's extremely hard to measure whether or not women peacekeepers are have a unique impact or a similar impact compared to men peacekeepers because they're so rare. There's relatively few of them and they're, they are in such a minority that it's difficult to, whether, to know whether or not they're having any type of unique or same impact because as Susie pointed out, most of the public doesn't actually interact with women peacekeepers and there's so few of them and they're operating within these larger kind of power structures within peace operations that it can be difficult to directly measure empirically their their outcome um but there are arguments that are made and there's um, evidence that's been uh, found in case studies of particular missions um, or particular peacekeeping units um, that point to women peacekeepers as uh, being able to uh, interact more easily with uh, the local women, which can help with information gathering, which can have that um, down the effect or down the line effect on overall effectiveness. Um, but I also, and kind of Susie and Lindy had already referenced that, so I won't go kind of too deep into that conversation. But I think kind of broadly, as Lindy had referenced and kind of started to discuss, I think a lot of times the focus, we get almost too focused on kind of what women peacekeepers do, what they bring, when more broadly, we might start wanting to start, want to start think about asking questions like, how are the peacekeepers trained? And how do those trainings bring in some gender dynamics that we currently are thinking of as women peacekeepers or men peacekeepers? What are the specific roles of the peacekeepers and how they're engaging with the public um, and where are they deployed and how that also is then going to impact anything that we can actually say about their effectiveness in the end. Um, so it ends up being extremely difficult to point to any specific actual effect of women peacekeepers because there are all these other dynamics that are playing out. At, they are playing out, um, but there is certainly kind of arguments and some uh, case study evidence uh, that women peacekeepers, um, at least in their interactions with the public, um, may have different types of interactions. Thank you, Dr. Huber. And you actually queued up my next question. Colonel Salehin, I was wondering if you could tell us, you spoke about the military schools in Bangladesh, and I know you have experience as a trainer and in training institutions. 
Can you tell us more about, you know, what is being done regarding training? What could be done? Any thoughts you have on this training space and its effect on perceptions or assumptions? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, the uh, peacekeepers training, we do not uh, do any discrimination about female training or male training. It is actually the common training for both of us, both the male and female members. And actually, we want that uh, they should be equally trained so that they can equally take up the job of peacekeeping while deploying the mission. About, uh, but uh, uh, for the female peacekeepers, we are to make a conducive environment so that they, uh, because you know that uh, some of the things uh, for the females, uh, 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 for example, the bulletproof jacket, the size uh, of the, the male members, which uh, does fit to a size uh, in the body of a male members, it will not actually fit to the uh, female, uh, female peacekeepers. So that need to be actually customized for the female. And also about the accommodation, because uh, since it is in uh, Bangladesh, I know that many of the countries, uh, the male and female, they, they might have shared the same accommodation or same dormitory. But for Bangladesh, it is uh, uh, for, for the social context, uh, for, we need actually a separate accommodation for the female. So that is uh, actually we are, uh, it doesn't mean that we are not doing the female peacekeeper training now. We have the female accommodation, but that is actually a part of the male accommodation being separated for the female uh, with the partition and other things. So uh, if it is a uh, female friendly accommodation, like we, we there we have the gymnasium, the, uh, the library, then the laundry and everything is separate for the female. So that, that will be female friendly. And that is why we wanted this. this. This is being done. And we are having also bringing female friendly bulletproof jackets, bulletproof helmets and everything for the females. And we want that this will be again deployed in the mission area so that they, they have it now. And for, um, uh, for the training, as I, have, uh, as I was telling you, that we do not uh, do any discrimination. We equally train both of them. But some of the uh, things uh, we need that especially should be trained to the females, like uh, for their uh, reproductive health and uh, th those things, are how to be make it fit in the mission area, because those uh, areas are actually not very challenging and not so uh, so much uh, it is away from home and how to remain mentally fit uh, because they have their families back here. So uh, some of these, this specialized training is given especially to the females, but for the other trainings, they, uh, the training is common and they equally uh, uh, join with them. In the training and about the core peacekeeping job like uh, so sometimes we even uh, to uh, give them the idea that you must uh, take uh, you must think yourself that you are uh, actually a peacekeeper first then you are a female not a female peacekeeper you are a peacekeeper first then you are a female so every time we are providing the training sometimes we bring them at front so that they know that uh, my responsibility is of the same as of my male counterpart uh, I don't know whether I, I could address the question correctly. Thank so you very much. That was that was very interesting to hear about. So I want to turn to um, both Susie and Lindy. A question that I think is underlying some of our remarks, but when we talk about the perceptions of women peacekeepers, it's really important, of course, to also talk about the perception of men peacekeepers and to see how you know different populations are perceiving ideas about men peacekeepers and about masculinities. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about this side of, you know, the, the gender binary, as we call it, as well as how do other identity factors intersect with gender norms and perceptions? So I'm thinking of nationality, race, age, ethnicity. How does all of that you know, influence perceptions and expectations? So Susie, if you wanna start us off and then I'll turn right to Lindy. Thank you so much once again. Um... In my first remark, I mentioned that uh, sometimes the cultures or the, the norms and the practice of the host communities deter the, the conversation or how closeness women within the, the, the host communities could interact with, uh, with peacekeepers. And uh, I also want to, 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 to say that um, it doesn't mean that there are no peacekeep women peacekeepers in the peacekeeping operation, but they are very few, but they also don't have that. Uh, most of them are not in the highest or senior rank. They, they are at the very, you know, they're just peacekeepers. So um, 
the question of race is a very important question because I will share, I will start with an example for myself that few years ago I, I had, um, I, I was doing some research with uh, one of the colleagues from the UK and uh, it was about the jungle estates and Mule intercommunal violence piece. And we were trying to, to bring the Dinker and the Nui and the, the Mule together to have some, some conversation around issues of uh, violence that involve child abductions, ghetto raidings. And this colleague, of course, she's from the UK, she's white. It was very difficult for her to, to, to even talk to the, to the chief. She's a female, yeah. She, she found it very difficult for her to, to talk to the chief because there was a perception that we can't really bring the, the Western ideology, the Western peace type, type of the peace, 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 peace process you want to impose on us. So when I came in with another colleague of mine, who's also a South Sudanese, the conversation was very smooth. It's not like they, they hit the, the colleague from the UK as a person, but there is that mentality of saying she's from the West, she's white, and you know we don't know what she's talking about, right? So, but when we came in as South Sudanese, they look at it as a local own initiatives, and they also look at it as a, um, something belong to them, right? So when we come to men peacekeepers, it's not that they are not very professional or not because they are not doing a job or they are not reaching out to the, the local community. Even men within the host communities find it very difficult as well to interact with male who are from another nationality. And especially when they are nationalities who are not African. So this is one thing. And uh, another thing is also um, language is another major thing. So sometimes you find out that also even women have difficulties with the language, which I did not mention earlier, that languages is another thing that affect even um, women to be very free and interact with, uh, with, 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 with peacekeepers, right? So, and peacekeepers find it very difficult as well to, to, to just walk to communities and start talking because, you know, most of the women in the host communities have difficulties with maybe foreign language like English or any other language. So that is one major challenge, but the advantage is that uh, peacekeepers have the opportunity to explore and go beyond some of the areas where women, I mean, um, where security is very difficult. And uh, maybe, for example, in places like, like Bentu, where women go to fetch water, look for firewood, it creates a security, a sense of security. And women feel they're very well secured from being attacked or being victims of any insecurity around the area because they know there are peacekeepers who are patrolling the area. But they don't have that much interaction with them as one-to-one -one or to share how they feel about uh, about the peacekeepers and how they feel about uh, the host community. So that's one culture play a very big role as well. So we, we, we don't need to lie about that. It's something we all know, but of course it's a, it's, it's a challenging situation. Thank you very much, Susie. I'm now gonna turn it to Dr. Heineken. If you could tell us a bit more about, you know, some of the other identity factors that influence perceptions and norms. In particular, I'm really interested in your ideas about masculinity and um, perceptions of men peacekeepers. Yeah, I, I think in terms of masculinity, I think what the first factor here is, is how do the soldiers portray their masculinity? If it's a kind of um, hyper-masculinity where there is disrespect shown and denigration of women, which you often see amongst, among soldiers which are trained and um, socialized into kind of a warrior ethic. So that, and that relates directly to how soldiers actually conduct themselves. And, and that is why I've been arguing, and if you've read my, the articles that I've written, I advocate strongly for a peacekeeping culture to be inculcated into the soldiers training that, that includes positive masculinities and positive femininities. So women are not timid and useless and, and afraid and so on. Women have got certain, they have certain feminine traits that they are more conciliatory, are more approachable, 
uh, can um, diffuse conflict a lot easier. And I can give you a wonderful example of this. But there's also negative masculinities, this overtly aggressive, abusive um, kind of conduct that we see on soldiers, where soldiers can be trained to be um, uh, more assertive, not quite as aggressive, um, and, and have a different kind and to have a different kind of skill set. So I think that is more what what we need to be looking at as the conduct of both men and women in these operations and a blending of attributes. Remember, we are socialized into certain roles. Sometimes people actually call that I'm very ag aggressive. I think my husband is more compassionate and soft than what I am, for example. So, you know, those attributes can be taught. So just as men can be taught to, to be more aggressive, so can female and vice versa. I think that is, is uh, one thing. But definitely the intersection um, that Susie has, has illustrated is critically important in these missions. For example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, we find that our soldiers are quite perceived quite positively in many respects because they can speak Swahili um, and the women can engage with the local population and so forth. But, and, and, and there is more of a willingness to deploy with the women in that context because of this and because they have a closer understanding of the culture. The complete opposite was experienced in the de deployment in Darfur, Sudan. The, the female peacekeepers, um, first of all, they couldn't communicate because they had to communicate by our translators. And secondly, they couldn't understand why the local women were actually stoning them every time they went into the market. So they didn't understand that their dress was being offensive, that the women in the market were told by their men that that we, these women are going to corrupt our culture, they are a threat, they send sentia from America, all those kind of things. So again, what this, what this illustrates to me is that when our peacekeepers are deployed, they, if I may use this term, they do not understand the human terrain sufficiently to be able to actually change public opinion and make a more meaningful contribution. Because as the soldier peacekeepers have told me time and time again, they receive only military training. The only gender training that they receive is around sexual abuse, sexual misconduct and so on. They do not understand the gender order and gender dynamics within specific communities. Hence, they cannot have effective security interventions if they do not understand that the cultural context has a profound influence on how they can assist these women. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate all of the really tangible examples our panelists are sharing. So thank you again. So I'm gonna read a question that came from the chat and I think I'll uh, maybe have Laura start us off. Are there any studies on the experiences and challenges that the female peacekeepers came across during their tour of duty in UN peacekeeping missions? Can you put some light on this? Uh, sure, so this is a, a really interesting question. I'm sure um, Dr. Heineken will also have some thoughts on this as well, as I know she's talked with a lot of peacekeepers, um, but I'll kind of start off with some of the information that I know of. Um, and I'll actually mention another ELSI initiative related project, which is the Measuring Opportunities for Women in Peacekeeping project, um, or the MOWIP. Uh, and this is a series of research that explores the experiences and challenges of both men and women uh, in the military and police, both peacekeepers and non-peacekeepers in several different countries. Um, and in it, they explored 10 different challenges that peacekeepers may experience both before they're deployed, while they're deployed, and then after their deployments as well, and how those challenges differed between men and women um, and how they differ across countries. Uh, and through some of the MOWIP research that's already come out, um, some of the major challenges were things that were 
continuum and they continued throughout both the pre-mission experiences through the mission itself and their roles on the mission. Um, and these included things like household constraints. Um, so expectations both before they deploy um, that women are going to act as caretakers for their children that can also make it extremely difficult for them to deploy in the first place. And then once they deploy, um, there's often perceptions that are being um, cast on them that they're being quote unquote bad mothers where there may not be that same type of kind of social stigma for fathers who are deploying. Um, and then on top of that, they're also expected oftentimes to engage in care tasks while they're deployed as well, um, both within their unit or contingent, they may be expected to do things like cleaning and cooking, et cetera. Uh, and then there's often um, pressure for them to engage in more community interaction projects and service projects um, than for uh, men peacekeepers as well. So they have kind of an added burden um, and added expectations on them while they're deployed. Um, and this connects with another major finding of that project was the, and something that we've already talked about, so I won't go into it in a lot of detail, but how gender roles are going to influence what tasks women are expected to take on and what others expect them to do while they're deployed as well. That can lead to a lot of frustration um, for women who want to deploy simply to act as a peacekeeper and not according to kind of these gendered expectations on them. Uh, and then as Lindy had referenced, there's also one of the themes that came up with um, other research and in that research as well was to some extent a lack of awareness of what to expect on the mission and a lack of preparation and training for the tasks specifically that the peacekeepers and women peacekeepers in particular would encounter on the mission. Um, for example, in that MOET project, um, they asked police officers and soldiers what they thought would be the most important skills that they would need on a peacekeeping mission if they hadn't deployed yet. And those who hadn't deployed said using weapons, combat skills, et cetera. And those who had deployed were far more likely to say communication skills, being able to interact with members of the public, et cetera. And so there was a bit of a gap and some women peacekeepers have deployed feeling that they were being put into situations which they didn't have a sufficient preparation for, especially if they were expected to interact with victims of sexual violence um, without proper training as well. Um, and that's not to only highlight the negatives. There are certainly um, women peacekeepers who have deployed and felt that they really did make a significant contribution. Um, but there are absolutely challenges that they face um, while deployed as well. Thank you, Laura. And I also just want to flag, and my colleague will be putting this in response to the answer for those joining on the webinar, but IPI has some reports about some of the experiences, particularly the negative experiences and challenges that female peacekeepers face. One of the reports is by Lata Vimir. It's called, I think it's called Taboos and Stigmas. Um, and the second one is by myself and some co-authors called Blue on Blue Sexual Abuse and Peacekeeping. So those are available on IPI's websites and get into some of these experiences. So Lindy, do you want to add anything? I know Laura said you might have anything to add. So I just want to give you the opportunity. Oops. Sure. Um, yes, I mean, I think some of the, most of the issues have been mentioned and I raised them in, in my, my short brief, but certainly some of the challenges also stem from sort of the cultural and patriarchal relations um, within the area of operation. So for example, and it's always nice to give concrete example, a uh, woman lieutenant that I interviewed, she was in intelligence. She said, for example, that the armed forces of the, the FADEC in, in, in the DRC, the, you know, the local armed forces there, did not want to communicate and, and accept any orders from her. So, oh no, sorry, she was a captain. So she had to give the orders via her lieutenant to, to that, to, to the armed forces. And then how they are perceived as sort of item, she said, and then when you, when you greet, um, uh, when you communicate or greet 
the the uh, the other forces then she said they would tickle the inside of your hand which is in, an indication like a sign that they want to have sex with you and she said those are the kind of things that she constantly kind of experienced so there, there's there's this constant sexualization that is taking place um, at various levels which is not obvious however i must also share this thing is that women's have mentioned to me on, on numerous occasions how their sexual agency has actually been beneficial to them in that they have been able to be able to get the different contingents to cooperate. They've gone out and said, man, let us work together. They've been able to get equipment quicker than, than men. And also when interacting with rebel groups, they say, oh no, we need, we, we use, I know that they're looking at me as if I'm a woman. And then I go and I use my womanliness to say, oh no, man, let's not fight this. Put down your gun. Let's first talk. Let's first talk. So they, they, you know, so the sexual agency plays out in, in various roles. We tend to focus on, on the extreme of sexual abuse, but, but we, you know, women have got a certain agency that they can use within these uh, missions um, that can be beneficial. So it again shows that a mix of having, a good mix of having men and women in any deployment is very beneficial to, to these operations. Thank you so much. So Colonel Salehin, there are two questions in the chat that I'm gonna combine and turn to you. One question is, what is the percentage of women who are listed in the Army, Navy, Air Force? And then also someone asks, could you talk more about the defense implementation plan? What is involved in this? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the uh, percentage of women, I think uh, this is about the uh, in the peacekeeping or uh, uh, I'll take it for the peacekeeping because this is about peacekeeping. So uh, at present, this is not very uh, much, uh, not, uh, but we are trying to increase it. So uh, this is the data we have. It is from uh, the Air Forces uh, Division. And uh, it says that in September 2021, the percentage of uh, officers, I mean, military observers was 6%, staff officers was 19%, but in the contingents, it is near about 3%. So uh, that was the percentage of the female peacekeeping, but uh, we are taking active measures to uh, increase its numbers. Now about the second question uh, about the uh, defense action plan uh, that I was talking about, this is actually a extension of the national action plan, which is being uh, taken by the Bangladesh government according to the WPS resolution 1325 to increase the number of uh, female in uniform and uh, uh, according to the NAP, six directives has been given to the Bangladesh uh, armed forces uh, to implement the national action plan according to the defense. Uh, so that is actually the extension of the national action plan and which are uh, we are now working on it. Uh, but unfortunately, this uh, uh, we are still working on it, and we is still not yet made public. But whenever it will be made public, uh, it will be known to all. But before that, because I was a, a member of that team, which was working on the uh, drafting the W uh, Defense Action Plan, so I can give you some uh, data that what is it about. So it, it, it actually talks about that how to number one uh, uh, primarily increase the number of uh, females in the uh, uh, uniform and, and also how to uh, ensure that they do not face face any gender-based discrimination violence abuse and everything and how this uh, gender uh, advisor gender network gender we have gender advisors at different levels starting from the armed forces division headquarter to the bases down to the unit we have the gender focal network how this network will be managed and what are the roles and responsibilities of this uh, ne uh, network? What is the responsibility of the gender advisor? What is the responsibility of the gender focal point officer? And how if someone has any uh, sort of uh, grievances or any complaint or uh, something, how it will be uh, tra transmitted to the appropriate authority? And if something on this line is happening, how this will be dealt with? and uh, there, there are some teams and there are some committees who will look after those so this is actually uh, uh, in short about the defense action plan thank you 
Thank you so much. And it's, it is helpful to have those numbers as we see, you know, as your efforts to increase the numbers of women serving in peace operations, we can really measure that increase. So thank you so much for sharing that and about the defense implementation plan. So I'm going to do a final round of closing remarks to panelists, combining kind of two questions that I think are maybe where we're thinking with our, our so what kind of, where are we, we've learned all about this, what now? So the first question and, and panelists, please feel free to answer either part of this. How can we advocate for more female representation in peacekeeping operations without reinforcing gender stereotypes? For example, the argument that women are more community oriented. I consider that these arguments may then not demand true gender equality and change. Is there a conversation about this in the sector? And then, oops, I think we, uh, all panelists, there we go, okay. And then this, the second question, which goes along well and kind of sums that up is how do you plan to encourage more women to join the armed forces? So Susie, why don't you start us off with any piece of these question, this question, thinking about female representation without reinforcing gender stereotypes, as well as encouraging more women to join forces and participate in peacekeeping and kind of combine that with any final remarks that you wanna share. Thank you so much. Uh, and this is a very good question. Uh, I think one thing we need to do is, the, is that the United Nations peacekeeping missions need to strategize on the elements that involve recruitment, advertisement of or call for of for peacekeepers. It's also a responsibility of contributing countries to look at the process involved in giving, you know, all citizens who are interested to, to be part of the peacekeeping operations. That way it will give women opportunity maybe to voluntarily come in and be part of the peacekeeping operations. Because at some point, I, it's very difficult for, for also emissions or for the UN or peacekeeping operations to, to say, we need a certain number of people. And maybe if there are no women who applied and then they are like, we need women. No, it should be voluntarily and should also be a responsibility of peacekeeping contribution countries. So that's one. The second one is uh, how do we, you know, allow, is it how, the second question is saying what, Phoebe? Yeah, around kind of implementation as well as increasing the number of women without relying on gender stereotypes or reinforcing gender stereotypes. So, yeah, so basically it should be something voluntarily and should also be a responsibility of contributing countries to allow women be part of we need to create also there's a need for advocacy to be created among the the contributing countries to understand what is the importance of peacekeepers what are the roles because sometimes people think that most of the peacekeepers they go to dangerous places and these places are very are very dangerous and risky for women and no one wants his daughter his wife or no woman want to go and die, you know, all this perception around the peacekeeping operations. So there's a need also to create an awareness about the, the, air, the environment involved and the importance. That way people will be voluntarily involved in the peacekeeping operations. Great, thank you so much, Susie. Lindy, I'll let you go with any closing comments um, in, in general or in response to any of those questions. Yes, I've scribbled down some notes. I think the first is to, to, to shift towards the, the ideal of equivalence, where both the contribution of men and women in these peacekeeping operations are valued equally, and women are not seen as a nice add-on that can potentially increase the effectiveness of the mission. Um, both men and women should be, should be trained more effectively to be able to interact with the local population. Um, so that is the first. And, and then I think in terms of, uh, of, of recruitment, we, we often don't see a problem with recruitment, but we see a problem with retention. And that is because women are, um, once they're in the military, they find that it is not a, a, a gender friendly 
environment and that they have to assimilate into the existing norms, practices and, and kind of behavior and ways of doing things, which, as I said, leads to a diluted femininity. And that is exactly what we don't want. So, so the organizational culture, the gender division of labor that exists, the stereotypes have to be addressed within to not only to be able to make the military a more um, a, 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 an employer which is considered to be more gender friendly, but within the organization, one should look at how existing roles, practices need to change. Thank you. Colonel Salehin, any closing remarks or comments on either of those closing questions I posed? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, after hearing some of the very negative uh, picture of some other countries, uh, I want to say that uh, this is not the case in Bangladesh. I want to end with a positive uh, note. Number one is uh, recently we have finished the uh, LC Institute Fund barrier assessment in Bangladesh, and this is not yet public, but this will be publicized after that. So the, some of the findings that has come out in this uh, survey, it is very interesting. One is that uh, many of our women, they've said that they joined these uh, armed forces not for uh, money or not for having a power or something. They said that it was, uh, it was her dream role to join the Bangladesh uh, armed forces, and that is why she has joined. So it speaks that how uh, they are being motivated to join the army. And another interesting thing that it, yeah, I think it should uh, uh, compel us to think more about uh, the role of women and men, because it was found in the survey that the male uh, peacekeepers were more homesick than their female uh, peacekeeper counterparts. So uh, that is the two uh, the factors. And the, uh, the most important thing I want to uh, highlight of, about this uh, uh, survey is that that uh, the female peacekeepers, those who had undergone a, a mission tenure, they said that they, in our one year tenure in the mission area, they did not face any uh, sexual harassment or abuse or anything in the mission area. And they were very comfortable there uh, performing their duties. So these uh, female peacekeepers, when they are coming back to Bangladesh and sharing their experience, and they are also shared with their uh, male and female counterpart, I think they are going to be a live uh, advertisement uh, by seeing those uh, more women or more, more of our uh, female members, female in uniform, will be actually uh, encouraged to join the peacekeeping. And uh, we hope that we really positively hope that in Bangladesh, especially, this will increase and uh, we'll be able to make uh, an almost an equal uh, participation of men and women in the future. Uh, so, uh, and about that, how to increase, I think, uh, uh, encourage women in uniform, I think I have partly uh, answered. And also, I think I have partly answered that how to encourage women in peacekeeping. Thank you so much, Colonel Salehin. I'm now going to turn the floor to Laura for any closing remarks, any responses to those questions, and kind of feel free to, to let us know what we should be thinking about and researching next in this field. All right, thank you all. So many of my colleagues have already made such fantastic points uh, in response to the two questions. So I don't have a lot to add to that, um, but I will just mention one thing that we've already talked about a few times and I've seen it in the chat. Um, but I think one way to move past um, gender dichotomies and to some extent stereotypes in this conversation uh, and something that I myself have kind of done in my research um, and need to be more aware of is moving beyond this discussion of women versus men peacekeepers and more in-depth exploring femininities and masculinities and the part that they play, um, not only in perceptions of the peacekeepers, but in the behavior of the peacekeepers as well. Um, so I think that's uh, one kind of path forward um, that we've talked about quite a bit today. Um, and then I also think another thing that's important to think about that we've, we've touched on, but when we're thinking about how to increase women's meaningful participation, both in the police and within the military, um, it's not necessarily enough just to have more women in the military or in the police to increase their participation in peacekeeping. Um, even if there are enough women in peacekeeping, there still needs to be awareness that those opportunities are available. There needs to be enough variety of the roles uh, that 
that those women are playing. So um, that's not, I think as Dr. Heineken might've said, it's not the same women being sent over and over in the exact same roles. Um, and there's also comfort with women and men deploying to peace operations. Um, and so I think there needs to be kind of more broad encouragement and awareness of these opportunities and what to expect on these opportunities across all individuals uh, within police and military forces. Um, and then also in the public just to get that initial um, recruitment and retention into the military and police as well. Um, but yes, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and then I'll just note with, I think, other paths forward, things that we've brought up here in this conversation as well, looking at how gender intersects with race, nationality, class, language, et cetera. Again, breaking down this category of just woman or just man, and really looking more at a holistic picture of peacekeepers and of community members. Thank you so much, Laura. I wanna flag that Laura's full report, The Impact of Women Peacekeepers on Public Support for Peacekeeping and Troop Contributing Countries will be available on IPI's website in probably the next two weeks or so before the end of May. So I encourage everyone to look into that report and it'll really, uh, talk more details about this really interesting survey and approach Laura took in trying to get at some of these challenging questions. So I, I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank our opening speakers and especially to the LC initiative. This is our final event as our first phase of research with the LC initiative. So it's been three years of a partnership and we're concluding with a wonderful event. So we will, at IPI, hope to explore some of these questions in further details. But thank you so much to our panelists, as well as to the audience for your thoughtful questions and engagement. So I look forward to staying in touch with everyone on this topic. Please do keep in touch with the International Peace Institute's Women, Peace, and Security Program as we continue to discuss and debate these issues. Thank you all, and have a wonderful rest of your day.